Okay, so welcome again. This is Rivera Sun for those who just popped on. Uh, this is the Nonviolent Responses to Hate, Xenophobia, and Discrimination webinar and Structured Dialogue. And I'm really glad that you all could join us today as a good-sized group for a conversation. And uh, I am going to just let Nina introduce the concept behind the webinar series that we're doing. And then I'll maybe say a little bit more about my organization that I work with, because uh, she'll cover the two that she works with. Nina, do you want to say a word? Maybe. Yes, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon. Maybe even. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there are actually any Europeans joining us today. Um, as we go. As I said, I'm from the Netherlands and um, the Foundation for Active Nonviolence. And um, with them, I do training for uh, nonviolence with young people. And these uh, webinars, they came into existence um, when we heard from Rivera and her books, uh, which are very exciting. And um, so what we wanted to do who is create more dialogue between the US and Europe. Nonviolence is much more unknown, actually, um, as we don't have the legacy of Martin Luther King. So, um, Rivera and I had a us, and uh, today's topic is one of them, so that's why we are here. Thank you, Nina. So uh, Nina, I don't know if she mentioned this, but her organization that she works with, SVAG, is 50 years old this year. So it's got quite some longevity in terms of educating about nonviolence. So as most of you know, the subjects we're going to talk about today in terms of our dialogue are pressing, they're urgent, they're affecting the global population. And for those who are from the US, they're very much affecting our US population. We have a long history of challenges around hatred, xenophobia, and discrimination. We have had a lot of actual nonviolent campaigns to try to resolve and address those issues as they manifest. But we're at a new chapter, a new corner of our history, a new turning point. And many people, including I imagine you guys and myself, have been looking for strategies and nonviolent responses that we can learn from and employ today when these issues and in the ways that these issues are arising in our own communities and in our broader country. So I'm going to just lay out a framework for us today in terms of some of the things that are going on. And I'm going to use mostly contemporary examples and all from the US and what I'm going to present. And then I'm going to let Nina and some of the rest of us use our collective wisdom to bring in the international scene as well. There's a lot going on on this topic and we have a lot to learn from one another. I just want to make a a brief note that my partner, Daryl, who's on the call, told me that, uh, as many of you know, Trump passed a ban on immigration from a number of um, predominantly Muslim countries in the world. Right now at JFK Airport in New York, um, a group of refugees is being detained under this order. So this is fast, this is immediate, and there's a, a counter-protest going to the airport right now to try to use public pressure to confront and challenge and start the process of getting this ban repealed and overturned. I don't have any more news than that, but I thought, wow, what an immediate and present story to start this conversation out with today. I am going to share my screen with you and go into a little slideshow that I've prepared. Okay.
Great. So I thought one way to effectively talk about the different ways to respond to hate, xenophobia, and discrimination is actually to go through what types of nonviolent actions have been and are being used to respond to these three types of problems. And there are many, many more examples beyond what I'm going to be able to bring up in a short 15 minute period. And so if an idea comes to you of something I haven't mentioned, make a note on your scratch paper or wherever you like to take notes and bring it up in the dialogue. The more examples we have, the more creativity we have for dealing with the problems that we're facing. So many people think of nonviolent action as protest or demonstration. And that's good, but that's just one type of the three to six categories, depending on how you uh, divide the types of nonviolent action that exist. Uh, there are over 198 methods of nonviolent action, and they all have a role to play in working on these problems. The first concept that I'd like to talk about a little bit is humanizing, educating, and connecting. That um, we know from the field of conflict studies that dehumanization lays the groundwork for violent conflict and war. That if a military wants to invade another country or two populaces are going to start a civil war, one of the very common features that occurs ahead of time is that the two populaces dehumanize each other. They come up with labels, names, stereotypes, propaganda. Um, and we see this as well around the issues of hatred, xenophobia, and discrimination. So one of the, the first and foremost tactics for addressing this is to humanize the groups in question. Not just the targeted or oppressed group or excluded group, but also the group that is doing the targeting and oppressing or the hate crimes um, that you know, both can suffer from being stereotyped and dehumanized. So the image you see on the screen is an action that happened during the organization I worked for, Campaign Nonviolence, uh, has a week of actions every year. And this year, our group in Roanoke, Virginia, created a, an action for diversity. So they gathered a fairly diverse group of people and they planned an action that happened the next day um, to hold up signs that said, ask me anything. And with that sign, they chose one of their identities, such as, I am Jewish, ask me anything. I am Muslim, ask me anything. I am LGBTQ, ask me anything. I am black, ask me anything. And they went into a public place in Roanoke, Virginia, and they stood there with their signs and engaged with the public and opened conversations. This is a very effective form of intersecting with people who may not be asking generous or kind questions, or they may be asking very uh, respectful questions, but opening the dialogues and putting a human face on the, the situation or the issues that can be very, um, that can thrive in isolation and separ separation and dehumanization. Another action that happened was a break bread with refugees. There were actually a number of these actions during the Campaign Nonviolence Week of Action, where people would gather uh, refugees and people from their community to actually break bread together in the very old historic, um, it has a Christian context, but it has an older context as well. Um, tradition of breaking bread and sharing stories around where they come from. So there's thousands of variations on this. There are workshops and webinars, um, talks and lectures on all subjects, diversity and uh, multicultural events that can be done. Um, there are social media campaigns. The list actually goes on. The dynamic works the same way. So the next category I'd like to talk about because we're bridging into it are nonviolent acts of protest and persuasion. And these are the types of actions that go beyond simply humanizing and connecting uh, people across the spectrum of the issues and into public action, uh, taking a public stand 
uh, with a message with a um, against a particular policy and in this arena there are I think this is a short list but I think in in the longer list there are over 50 different types of different kinds of protest and persuasion this slide is one of a very interesting situation that happened in Richardson Texas the anti-islamic uh, groups in Texas decided to start doing armed demonstrations outside mosques and Islamic centers. And this group of nonviolent protesters came to do a counter demonstration. Now, at the demonstration, it was very, very tense. Uh, some of my friends were there. And they used skills of nonviolent conflict resolution, uh, the Clara method of communication, nonviolent communication, de escalation tactics to make sure that the opposing viewpoints had an opportunity to create public discourse and interchange instead of violence and conflict. So, on this side of the street, you have the nonviolent pro. Um, inclusion, welcoming, refugees, diversity, pro-Islamic group. On the other side of the street, you had the anti-Islamic group that was armed and carrying hate signs. Behind the protesters, um, the nonviolent protesters, you had um, the Islamic Center and people in the Islamic Center. This was a situation that replicated throughout Texas during that time period. So this, there were more than one occurrences of this. It was a very effective way of uh, showing the Muslim communities that there were non-Muslim allies who would take a stand, who would confront the people who are actually causing the intolerance and the hatred, and that they would do so non-violently. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. I hope you're okay with that because I do want us to talk and have a dialogue, um, but this is the framework of, of some of the ideas. The second category, or I guess this is the third category of nonviolent action that I'll talk about today is non-cooperation, where you withdraw consent and cooperation from such systems and policies and practices, laws, um, businesses, uh, there's a number of of different categories that are causing injustice, causing in this case that we're talking about hatred, discrimination, and uh, xenophobia. This map is the, the, the little pinpoints of the sanctuary cities and counties um, and state policies and legislations uh, throughout the United States that are countering a situation that goes back further than Trump um, through it goes back through several administrations in response to uh, our poor quality of immigration law and its discriminatory practices. Namely, one of the, the key aspects of sanctuary cities is that the police departments have often refused to lend services and personnel to helping um, ICE, the Department of Immigration, uh, round up illegal immigrants in the cities. This goes down to things like the police departments will non-cooperate with rounding up school children, non-cooperate with uh, deporting parents. They will refuse to reveal a list of locations and addresses that they know. They will not stop people who look like an immigrant on the street. They actually adopt a policy by which that is not a cause of stopping and detaining a person. Uh, so there's a number of other ways that sanctuary cities operate as well to create a, a situation of inclusion and welcoming while we work as a nation to resolve the injustices that are built into our immigration practices. With Trump's escalation of immigration issues, including uh, building a wall along uh, where the Mexico-U.S. border, which actually already mostly has a wall, um, and his current ban against Muslim nations uh, and people from Muslim nations immigrating to the U.S., um, there is an escalation of cities joining the Sanctuary Cities project and the a recommitment of values from the Sanctuary Cities to the point where the mayor of Boston recently made a proclamation saying that um, 
immigrants and illegal immigrants specifically could stay in city hall if necessary. They could stay in his office if necessary. But that the national policy being rolled out around immigration was so un-American that he had to non-cooperate with that in its entirety. This is a, a story from the Arizona-Mexico border that the tribal nation, Tohono O'odham, has refused to cooperate with the Trump administration's plan to build and reinforce the wall along the Mexico-Arizona border. Their nation crosses the border, it occupies 75 miles of that border, and they are absolutely refusing to build a wall there. It's just a very good very excellent form of non-cooperation by a uh, specific body in the U.S. So in addition to non-cooperation, you also have acts of intervention where non-cooperation withdraws support, intervention gets in the way of the problem. Uh, so there are a number of different forms of that, which I'm not going to go into all of them right now. But a few examples come to mind. Uh, this is at the University of Michigan, where the Muslim students have been doing a, um, an act of humanizing or an act of public demonstration by doing prayers in public places. They faced intimidation and harassment uh, at a certain point in time. And beyond the praying Muslim students, you can see this standing line of um, people and what they're doing is they have formed a protective circle around the Muslim students praying to stand in solidarity and to intervene in any attempts to harass and intimidate people for practicing their faith within the United States. Now many of you may have heard stories from many other places around the world where this sort of action has occurred, um, both Christian and Muslim, uh, Jewish, Hindu, all, almost every group in any place where there has been forms of faith-based or religious-based violence, hate crimes, or conflict has used this tactic. Uh, some that come to mind are Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey, um, Greece, I believe, but I could be wrong with that. So just so you know, it, it does replicate. One other story of intervention, and this may be familiar to some of you. This young girl, Natasha, was harassed one day as she walked to school at Baylor University in Texas, pushed off the sidewalk and called a slew of racial slurs. She tweeted about it to a friend. A friend tweeted about it to a wider social network. And the next day, 300 students showed up to walk with Natasha on her way to school. Uh, becoming an act of protective accompaniment and also protest and persuasion against racial discrimination um, that was on the rise throughout the uh, electoral presidential campaign of Trump and is still on the rise right now. So the last category I'm going to talk about in this section of today's webinar is just a particular story that tickles me very much um, and falls under the category of creating alternative institutions. Alternative institutions have played a tremendous role in nonviolent struggles throughout the world um, and including in contexts that we don't necessarily think of as nonviolent. For instance, the decade preceding the Revolutionary War in the American independence struggle was actually a decade of nonviolent struggle in which alternative institutions created a parallel government that could withstand and organize the United, the forming United States in a independent struggle that involved lots of different kinds of nonviolent actions. So alternative institutions in this particular case, um, this is an interesting one because the discrimination here is about science um, and that is not an arena that we currently think of as a form of discrimination, but actually has a long history of this. In fact, the persecution of Galileo and Copernicus is a very parallel example of uh, the official policy of state or state religion against scientific inquiry and discovery. 
In this case, uh, for those who don't know, the US, uh, the Trump administration has been cracking down on climate related science. And this has been a fear or a suspicion for quite some time now since Trump was elected. So NASA scientists are doing offsite backup of their climate data. The EPA um, was ordered to shut down its climate data access points on its website. There was a, a storm of resistance and the Trump administration has at least momentarily backed off of that. But the Trump administration told the National Park Service that they could no longer uh, use the words climate change or tweet climate science out through their official government Twitter and Facebook accounts. And so a park ranger at the Badlands National Park who was running the Twitter account actually went rogue for a day and started just tweeting all thing, kinds of things just about climate change. And when he was ordered to cease and desist, uh, this alternative Twitter site called Alt Nats Park Sur popped up. And it started being an alternative, uh, non-official uh, park service Twitter account. And as you can see, the first um, one of the, the first tweets they put out was, can't wait for President Trump to call us fake news. You can take our official Twitter, but you'll never take our free time. This now has over a million followers in a 36 to 48 hour time period. There are 52 other alternative government um, Twitter handles that have emerged and it's becoming a, a form of creative resistance that is giving people a lot of hope and courage to speak out against the discrimination against science that is currently going on in the US. So I'm going to stop the share now. As you know, there are so many examples that I could quote and cite on this. Almost every nonviolent struggle for social justice that we have seen in the United States and often around the world has had a component of dealing with hatred, discrimination, xenophobia. Um, and we have a lot of resources for dealing with this in our community. And I'm sure that in our conversation today, we will actually have a good chance to get into even more of these examples. I think we should feel heartened by these examples. We should feel heartened by the long lineage of work that has been done around the world. And we should take them to heart in being heartened by them and find ways to think about ourselves, our own communities, and the networks we are a part of in terms of applying these ideas and concepts to the problems that we face in very tangible and real ways in our present times. So thank you. Thank you for listening to that. And let's take a breath because breathing is good. And I'm going to hand the microphone over to Nina to introduce the next part of our conversation today and to get the ball rolling in terms of how we're going to start this. Hi, yes, so... Uh, uh, we would like to of uh, hate, discrimination, and xenophobia um, and in your surrounding. And maybe you can indicate it from a scale of one to five. So yeah, I think it will be handy to raise the hand now, Rivera, or do you want to use the chat box? Yeah, let's... Um raise our hands and I'll call on you one by one just in case your Skype your zoom broke up a little bit like mine Nina was saying to get us all present and speaking together we'd like you to do a little self poll for yourself and your community and your maybe your nation um, about how bad these problems are hate discrimination xenophobia on a scale from one to five and so just think about that. How, how bad do you think these problems are? 
And I'm going to call on Weldon. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, I live in Seattle, which is probably one of the uh, uh, most progressive places in our country, but it is uh, definitely happening. There are incidents of all kinds happening. They did it at the University of Washington recently and um, so on. So I would say on the scale of one to five, it's probably four and rising. All right. Thank you. Well done. Brad. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, there was an interesting article that apparently the BBC picked up about uh, my town here in Lancaster, that we've welcomed more refugees per capita than any other town in the United States, um, 20 times as many, which is great, but there are also lots of incidents of intolerance here. Um, we seem to have both going on. Um, on a scale of one to five for my community here, I would probably rate it at about a three. All right, great. Thank you, Brad. And thank you for sharing some of your context as well. Sure. I think we will find as we go on that there's a lot of stories that we have. Um, so if you want to add a little context short in a brief format like Brad and um, Weldon have, that would be great. But let's keep our comments brief so we can dig deeper too. Tim. Yeah, in Virginia, I'm about two and a half hours south of Washington, D.C. So here the climate, I think, would be a five. Uh, I feel like it's as bad as it's ever been. Well, thank you for that, Tim. I appreciate the sincerity and honesty. I'm just gonna remind people that if you don't know how to raise your hand, uh, it's you click on participants at the bottom of your screen and a little raise hand icon will show up at probably on your right hand side of your screen. Let's hear from Kathy. Hi, I'm from, I'm in Philadelphia and our city has a long history of um, being supportive of various different groups and um, is a sanctuary city but in recent times we are th this is being challenged and um, I would say that we are possibly three at a level of maybe three or four and rising great thank you Kathy So it would be great to hear from all of you. I'm going to unmute our two friends on the telephone. Actually, we just have one friend left on the telephone, and that's Erica. I'm not sure what happened to Jean. She dropped off, unfortunately. Uh, so that, because I, you don't have a hand raising function, so if you want to chime in, your mic is open. Thank you, can you hear me? I was muted on my own phone as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear you. All right, hello, I'm Erica and I am in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I live in a city in a state that has a lot of diversity that celebrates that diversity. Um, however, there have been um, several hate crimes. There was a speaker in town uh, last night who is associated with white supremacy and the quote alt-right movement whose bus sign is so offensive and filled with hatred that the news had to white out what this tour bus says on the side of it in reporting on um, the speaker. So I would say it's probably between three and four. Personally, as I was joining this call, I had um, a hate comment posted on one of my social media pages in response to an article I had posted written by a feminist person of color. Um, and so I just think 
that the dialogue is really shifting uh, in our country in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. That is good to remind us that it's happening in the virtual sphere as well as on the ground in our streets and in our communities, sometimes even more boldly. I'm not sure if I'm glad that it's bolder in the virtual sphere than on our streets, but it is an important thing to work on. It's definitely not the time to be silent, which is why these dialogues are important. So we have some skills and tools for going forth. All right. It looks like, Jay, your hand is up and I'm going to call on you, even though you're in the middle of walking. I'll, I'll give you a chance to reposition. How about that? Okay, there you go, Jay. Great. Hi, folks. I'm actually Jean Rivera. I was on the phone earlier, and I switched over so I could see you. So in Oakland, California, I, I think um, I live close to downtown, demonstrations, helicopters all the time overhead. So there's a sense absolutely of militarization of the police. Um, certainly, it's a very active community, and um, that's great. I also live across the street from a mosque, and I work very hard to be a good neighbor, and um, that's a, a good stretch. Uh, one challenge also, though, I'm also a housing provider, a small landlord in a town where um, it, there's extreme hysteria about affordability and housing crisis, so it's very interesting for me to be on the other side of, um, you know, kind of an oppressed uh, that, that's definitely actually I would move that to like a five actually mm. so interesting yeah thank you Jane thank you for bringing up that other side of the equation which uh, Nina was sent me a, a little note earlier she probably doesn't remember this but um, about the role that reconciliation and truth truth first and reconciliation actually play in de-escalating the the escalation of these and that each side of an equation has a truth that wants to be heard whether it's you know the ultimate truth or not it's a piece of the truth and until it is heard and recognized oftentimes there is no resolution that can come forward while some of you are thinking about raising your hand getting over shyness uh, finding a way to raise your hand or simply turning your microphone on and speaking. I just want to share briefly that I grew up in Maine, which used to be the whitest state in the nation. I'm not sure we still have that distinction. And in the little town that I lived in in the 19, uh, early 1990s, late 1980s, we had thousands of Somali refugees brought in uh, during the famine and the Civil War by a pair of ministers in our area, and most of us had never seen a black person before. I know I personally had only ever seen my sister's one African-American friend. And they were Muslim, the town was Christian, and there was a lot of animosity around this uh, because for a number of reasons, many of them economic in nature. And the towns, it's a twin city town, so uh, the towns that I lived in had to do a lot of work very rapidly around this issue. And they still continue 20 years later to do work around reconciling and introducing the two populations to each other and de-escalating the uh, fear, resentment, separation, isolation, suspicion, discrimination, hatred. Um, so it's real. It's not, it's not like it's just uh, snap your fingers, make a national policy, and it's all going to be good. It gets down to human beings and the way that we interact together. Nina, let's go to you. Your hand's up. Yes, I hope you can hear me clearly. So I um, was thinking about a few examples also from Europe, uh, as you mentioned. Um, so I thought to start, actually, um, Rivera, she um, noted this article to me of the uh, Dutch Minister of Development who started a foundation to uh, support abortions 
uh, as a reaction to Trump who wants to um, prohibit them or limit them significantly. And um, um, yeah, of course, also, I think you've seen the women's march going viral, not just in the US, but uh, we had one in Amsterdam and in so many cities all over the world. So there's also, um, yeah, things going on around Trump and his ideas uh, in other places, of course. And then um, in the Netherlands, we have actually a politician that is not as bad as Trump, I would say, but he is also quite uh, Islamophobic. And um, so some people have actually sued him for hate speech and they won the case. Um, but also I think it is, you know, that's a, a kind of traditional way to go to court. And uh, so some other people organized a really big march in September last year uh, to celebrate diversity because they're concerned about the, the growing polarization. And um, yeah, I think this is happening in many countries in Europe, actually, especially in the East. So that has to do as well with the refugees from uh, mainly Syria now. And it's uh, really a uh, significant rise of the number of people that want to seek asylum in Europe. And still, it's like nothing compared to uh, what countries like Turkey and Lebanon are hosting. Um, yeah, and then, oh, I forgot to mention about hate speech, that there is a whole movement, actually, that is supported by the European Commission. Um, so it is a youth movement against hate speech from uh, yeah, all countries in the EU, really. Um, and then I wanted to point out a group that is uh, also, I think, in different countries, at least for sure in uh, Sweden and also in the Netherlands, that is uh, No One Is Illegal. And it is uh, helping people without uh, papers. And um, they also do protests at the detention center in the airport of Amsterdam, Schiphol. It's a really big airport. And so people are being sent um, back to their countries. But sometimes it's actually still quite dangerous. Um, yeah, so they do like this public actions. Uh, and then we also have um, two days that became more um, popular, which is the day, the International Day for Peace on the 21st of September. And there's really many actions uh, going on in the Netherlands. And one organization um, called, yeah, they created this thing that they call the um, embassy, I think, for peace. So you can be an ambassador and uh, host an activity. So I think it's a bit similar to what Campaign Nonviolence is doing, actually. Uh, it's a whole week. And also in uh, November, there's a week around the day for dialogue. So there's uh, people that are actually trained, I think in some places through the municipality. So the municipality supports this action and sometimes even uh, gives space to host them. Um, yes, and then I wanted, I um, spent some time in Israel, Palestine. So I wanted to share two examples from there and it just came to mind now on the call uh, as we were talking about the wall between the US and Mexico. So one uh, family actually that has really inspired me. Um, they have this project that is called the Tent of Nations. And um, what happened to them is that they are on a little hill which is surrounded by um, Jewish settlements and they of course uh, want that this family will leave their land so they can also take the hill and have like a block. Uh, so the family, they, they have papers from a very long time ago and they um, then there is, well they went to court and they couldn't really evict them 
but still they try to do anything to get them off the land. And uh, one of the things that they tried is to say they don't really cultivate enough of their land to be able to stay. And so um, this family, they uh, asked people, they invited people to their land to help them to cultivate it. And this is how um, the name of the Tent of Nations came into existence as they hosted people from different nations in a big tent. And uh, yeah, they're very creative. Like they're not supposed to build anymore on the land, so they start to build under the ground and make caves or host chickens in a car and <laughs> things like this. Um, yeah, and it's uh, their, one of their slogans is uh, we refuse to be enemies. So I just very much like this uh, attitude. They also actually invite Israeli children to their um, land. So they have summer projects with uh, Israeli and Palestinian children and children from other countries as well, I think. Um, and then there is another organization I worked with who works also a lot on healing hatred and overcoming fear. Uh, and I think that, that this idea was kind of born uh, when the director of this organization, who is Palestinian, went to Auschwitz and saw like how much fear there actually is. And I think that this is um, such a powerful emotion that is driving uh, xenophobia and discrimination. Uh, so that's also, I would say, under this hate, there is just so much fear. And um, I was wondering if you have maybe some other examples and ideas of how we can address that. So that's my question back to you. Thank you. There we go. Let's see if that worked. Okay, so thank you, Nina. I'm glad you brought up all those examples, uh, especially from other places in the world, um, because it is really important. Um, there, I mean, and there really are stories from every country in the world, because this is not actually just a problem faced by a few countries or a few part of the populace. There is a problem of white supremacy in the world, but it is certainly does not stop it in there in terms of hate and discrimination. So, I put out a link in the sidebar to five ways to counter hate, harassment and intimidation, and these are direct intervention skills that anyone can use. It's a resource for you. These come from the, the Michigan Meta Peace Team, from their work actually going to demonstrations that have a high likelihood of tensions or into violent conflict situations, both internationally and domestically, we asked them to put together a list of tips for people for what do you do if you see it right in front of you? How do you, how do you help? And so this is their list on that. And I'm going to send you, hopefully that worked. Well, it did not work. There we go. Another document called Five Ways to Trounce Trump, Nonviolence Versus the Nazis. Not all of this is right on point. Some of it is more uh, war and peace related, uh, which of course also has to do with nonviolence and I mean with hate and discrimination. But there are several stories in there about uh, rescues of Jews or resistance to discrimination against Jews or to uh, LGBTQ, they didn't call them that in those days, but um, the non-Aryan populations, particularly in the occupied countries that the Nazis took over. Uh, these stories are good frameworks for us for thinking about what's possible now in our communities and what might need to be done in our communities. Um, for example, there is a story, that it's not in here, but if that comes out of Nazi occupation period, uh, about non-Jews registering for a Jewish registry to flood that system and to mask and hide and conceal who was Jewish. Now we have that going on right now as well with the threatened Muslim registry in the United States that thousands of Americans who are not Muslims have also 
committed to signing that registry to help stand in solidarity and to mask and protect those who are being persecuted and also act as a form of non-cooperation. So I want to go back to Nina's question now and frame it as an opening for group discussion. What, how are people organizing in your area or your networks to deal with these very real problems? What are some stories that you know that you might wish to share? Or conversely, what is a story that you have heard that you think should be added to the conversation? Yes, you can think about the question a little bit, don't worry. <laughs> well, you, oh, good, Tim, let's call on you. Yes, well, um, my wife and two daughters and a close friend were fortunate enough to go to Washington, D.C. for the Women's March on Washington. And I don't know what a million people looks like, but I think I've experienced it. Um, what we saw there was uh, solidarity and people just joining together to show that uh, this is what democracy looks like. And it was just a privilege and an honor to be part of it. Great, thank you for sharing that, Tim. I know that um, for many people, that was a common experience of suddenly feeling like we're not alone because 4.5 million people worldwide, with 3.3 million of those in the U.S. marched on that with the sister marches or in unaffiliated marches. One story that came to mind as you're thinking of stories to share is uh, a story that I read about an African-American man who set out to make friends with KKK members. And the way he went about it was he just asked them a simple question. How can you hate me if you don't even know me? Get to know me. Then you can hate me, basically. And he ended up befriending hundreds and hundreds of KKK members and getting at least 300 of them to actually leave the clan and give him their robes. He has a whole closet full of KKK robes that he has collected from people who have renounced that because of his one simple question and his willingness to open that conversation. I can imagine he has a lot of stories from his experience. There's a documentary coming out or it just came out about him. So I wish I could remember his name and then I could put the link for you, but a good story of individual action specifically making a difference. Jane, let's call on you. I was going to mention, hello folks, I was going to mention I participated in the um, Dakota Access Pipeline protest in San Francisco and what was particularly impressive about it was the leadership by the Native Americans. They just totally kept control of the situation that, like there was one point when somebody from the crowd came up and tried to talk with anger and they just really steered the conversation and um, they also held a nonviolence training and, and there were people there also who kind of had more of an identity politics thing going on and it was really powerful how strong the leadership was of you know just corralling people into that this is um, our movement and um, we're, we're absolutely adhering to the nonviolence it was really felt very safe and, and very expansive to be part of that. Great, thank you, Jane, for sharing that story. And you're reminding me of the Cowboy and Indian Alliance uh, out of Nebraska that was organized to fight the KXL pipeline uh, as a really good example of two groups that have historically been very much at odds, ranchers and Native Americans in the Nebraska region. But the organizing work that was done there was really designed to lift up first their common ground and then create containers and spaces for people to come together and then work from there on shared goals around this pipeline. And so the common goal, the common ground that they held was love of the land, ironically. Um, and then for the Nebraska ranchers, the public, I mean, the 
Im the eminent domain clause was very uh, strong for them. They did not want their land taken by the government for a pipeline company, which was ironically very similar to what the native tribes were saying as well. Uh, so the building of common ground is a place to start. And the reason this common ground is a funny phrase is that one of the creative projects that's happening in the town I grew up in is, a, I think it's a 30 acre farm run by Somali uh, immigrants um, that started out because the UU in Auburn, which I actually went to as a kid, um, let them let a, a small group of Somali immigrants set up a produce stand after the church service so that they could actually have a source of employment. Um, now it's grown into this 30 acre farm that is a major um, part of this, the local food community in uh, the area and works as a cooperative. So sometimes it's literally common ground that can start to break down these barriers. And one of the things is that if we're always organizing and trying to change these issues based on our differences or the problem, we sometimes lose the opportunity to let those differences subside through working on a shared arena, bringing people together around something we actually all enjoy. So just, just another thought of tactics in there. Sometimes a movie night that brings the two communities together might be more effective than a community discussion on the issue of intolerance. Just a thought. Yeah, Brad, let's go to you. Yes, I just wanted to mention that uh, tomorrow night in Lancaster City, there's a, a refugee concert at a club downtown. And it's interesting because this refugee concert has been held every year in Lancaster City for the last like five or six years but it takes on special meaning this year. Um, there's a lot of folks coming, uh, a lot of bands will be playing, and a lot of the refugee families from Lancaster will be there. And so it's kind of what you were just saying, which is folks are gathered around something that they all enjoy, which is music. And then there's a human face on it with these families being there. Um, the food that's served is going to be um, from the various countries where they, they come from, like Bhutan and Nepal and things like that. So, you know, it's a, it's a great way to sort of break down those barriers and get folks together around a common theme. Great. Thank you, Brad. Sure. Nina. Um, yeah, I was reminded of... Um, something from the Netherlands, which is virtual custom during the St. Um, Nicholas celebration, which is in the beginning of December. And uh, I think two years ago, even the UN got involved and uh, called out on this as a racist um, custom, actually. Yeah, so there is, uh, we have this Saint St. Nicholas who has a helper, which is called the Black Peep. And it's actually a character that is like very stereotypical. It's uh, called blackface. So, you know, like um, completely black and big earrings, uh, red lips, uh, acting often a bit funny or uh, jokingly. And um, there has now been a group. So first, yeah, there was actually a lot of um, resistance. And this year, last year, I mean, 2016, uh, in the official, so every year, the St. Nicholas is coming to the Netherlands by boat. So this is something all the children believe in, right? Uh, he's coming by boat. And then uh, there were peats, like, who were not black. So they had different colors or um, were white and uh, I think that was really a big success because it was something that was going on for the last five years. Um, and then there was also a uh, funny incident with some people uh, in a neighborhood. I don't remember in which city, but it was around this um, time of St. Nicholas. 
uh, that people somehow use it as uh, um, yeah, like they, I, I guess some uh, people are just feeling attacked in their uh, identity or so. So they um, actually attacked, I think that some huge threw a Molotov cocktail into a mosque. Like all of this is not related to anything, of course, with St. Nicholas celebration, but um, because it was around this time, then some people in the neighborhood um, went inside the mosque during the daytime and they put little presents in the shoes of uh, all the people that were praying there. Because that's the custom that we do, like the children, they get the presents in the shoes instead of the socks, I think, in uh, Christmas. So it was like such a nice way of uh, saying, we don't agree with um, these other people who draw the Molotov cocktail into the mosque. Thank you, Nina. I think that's such a, a important point you brought up right there of the importance of making it really known to the community being persecuted or the group being persecuted that there are many of us who don't agree with the persecution. That sometimes uh, this is extremely important in changing and transforming the situation. We could do it as individuals or as uh, governmental bodies. The Denver City Council, for example, recently made a proclamation of, uh, I forget what the name of it was, but inclusiveness and belonging, uh, making a public stance as the city council that everyone, regardless of, and then you can go down the whole list of everything that should be on that list, gender, race, um, legality of citizenship, um, you know, ethnicity, religious background, all of it. They were all welcome and that the city council is committed to working diligently upon creating policies that back up that statement. Very profound thing to say right after Trump's election and the rise of uh, hate crimes and the fear that was in people's hearts. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of church communities or religious communities that have made public declarations and stances um, that these play a really important role. Uh, just as the Women's March played a really important role for demonstrating that's what we call it a demonstration right demonstrating to us all how many people do not agree with what's going on that this kind of work is is crucial kathy let's hear from you yes thank you um nina's story reminded me of a little story that happened shortly after the um election in western philadelphia there's a uh, popular cafe that's run by muslims and um, the people in the neighborhood left them a bunch of flowers and a handwritten note saying that they were supportive of them and thanking them for their, for their contributions to the community and um, basically telling them that they had their backs. Um, and I found that very heartening. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just all right great well i was going to issue an invitation to those who have not spoken up yet to speak up and then two of you raise your hand so i'm going to go to ruth and then to dariel i'm from the i'm from the kansas city area and um, i'm a pastor at a church um, associate pastor so work within the community in that capacity we've done um, a number of things actually this was back in the fall but it's a continuing issue um, we had at our church uh, Thanksgiving welcome to the newest Syrian refugees um, that had come into our community and we work with an organization called KC for refugees which is specifically trying to assist um, Syrian refugees so there's been that put a face on the Syrian um, refugee crisis and those coming into our community at a time when um, you know folks are, are being um, make you feel like they're not wanted here and um, really caused our congregation to uh, want to help and so we've been involved in you know helping to supply clothes and things like that um, so people have responded very well and, and perhaps we'll do that again so these new refugees do feel that 
um, kind of the, the mixed welcome or not um, in the community. And so being welcomed into the church and being told we're really happy they're there. Um, they expressed that meant a great deal. I, we're also a part of an organization that's, co that's called the Metropolitan Organization for Racial and Economic Equity, and it's been working on a lot of different issues, but most recently um, has had a, um, a gathering of congregations in our area. Um, works with a gamaliel organization, so a community organizing organization. But um, it, it was around the, uh, the issue of uh, undocumented folks, and so ha was both kind of helped congregations in our area, which a lot of them are, they just need a lot of education, as you pointed out, and a human face, but uh, invited them to consider or get involved in discussion about becoming sanctuary churches and um, had people uh, raise, you know, write down cards if they were willing to accept children and take care of children who may be left behind, um, if there's deportation, and then also ask commitments from the local um, sheriff and, and all to, and, and get, they gave them to not cooperate with ICE in um, trying to, in, in committing their resources to help with deportation. So it was a way that a fairly unpolitical congregation actually is, gets together with others and it gets moved along. Um, and a lot of folks there were Spanish speaking. It was, it was translated. We have a couple churches um, that are, are Spanish speaking in the area. And so they also felt that that communal affirmation at a time that's kind of scary for a lot of them. And then finally, I, I will try not to talk too long here, we have an organization in Kansas City, um, a couple of them, we have an organization that's similar to Black Lives Matter. It, it basically is that, but it's got a different name. And then another one um, that is, is pretty much of white folk looking at their own inter internalized um, racism, so working on themselves. Um, and this organization, I was, I was quite impressed. Um, I don't go out every time, but when I've gone, it's just hundreds of young adults, mostly, um, that were packed into this uh, church, probably 300, um, talking about these issues. And then they, they work closely with um, the, what is uh, Black Lives Matter movement to kind of see how they can be supportive of them. Um, so I, they've participated in as going along with them on marches, and, and I went on one with them, so it was supporting their march, if you sense. And then more recently, there was something they were, um, the Black Lives Matter movement was doing, and um, there's a lot of conversations so that, that this group is supportive, but not, doesn't take it over, that, that tries to be really sensitive to the issues involved and not, um, you know, not take over the organization, if you will, but really work cooperative and sometimes not, not um, uh, be present if that's not what's helpful too. So those are some of the things that are happening in our area. Great, thank you, Ruth. I'm really glad to hear all those engaged stories from on the ground in your community in a place where it's not necessarily easy. I mean, even Weldon was saying in Seattle, it's Seattle's about as inclusive oriented as you get in the United States and that they're still struggling. They have the struggles as well, but uh, I appreciate your stories and what you, the work that you're doing and hearing about that. Oh, there actually is one other I meant to mention, if it's okay. Um, we had a few years ago, a shooter target our Jewish community center in Overland Park in, yeah, uh, several people were killed. It turns out not no one who was Jewish, a couple Methodists who were there and I think maybe a Catholic person. But anyway, it was a hate crime. Um, someone who was very, um, certainly did not regret his action after he was caught and talked to him. But the result of that is that the, um, the widow who lost both her 
you know, this mother, this person who lost both her mother and her, her, her excuse me, her son and her father um, was part of a, a large church in the area and organized um, an event that happens yearly on that same week of, of that, that when that crime was done. And for seven days, there's various events that are seeking to promote understanding and tolerance. So there was one that uh, a year or two ago that uh, with the Muslim community explaining life and perspectives and stuff that others were invited to. But then it kind of rounds up with a, a great big walk um, for the whole community to move, to walk from this larger church or from the Jewish Community Center to this church, and then there's a lot of speakers. So that was impressive to me, and someone who was directly impacted by a hate crime, although she wasn't meant to be the target, her family wasn't meant to be the target, but out of that has come every year this week-long effort to promote tolerance and understanding and solidarity with folks. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, you're reminding me that restorative justice uh, can often become a vehicle for the types of change and transformation that we're looking for on a case-by-case -case, but also community level understanding because it often is a process that does bring together the multiple pieces of the truth and opens a, the capacity to hear diverse perspectives on the situation that unfolded. Daryl, I want to call on you because you haven't spoken yet. If uh, in the group, if they, uh, if, if there's any experience in helping to develop movements or campaigns or actions based on the intersectionality of racism or gender or other uh, uh, traditionally discriminated against minority groups, uh, in regards to the intersection of that and economic factors, wealth, income, poverty. Here in, we live in New Mexico, and New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the United States. It's either first or second, depending upon the year. And we have also some of the counties in New Mexico that are amongst the highest income counties in the country. But I'd be interested to see if there's if there anyone has done any work in using intersectionality as a way of approaching or building alliances, building allies to uh, work in the racism arena. Thank you. Just to clarify, Daryl, because I think you asked me this before, you want to know about people who are working with class and economics to do intersectional work around the alignment of the many other types of discrimination that people face. Right, exactly. So that's a, that's a question for the group. You know, there was one, Daryl, uh, right at the end of the civil rights movement. There was a rather well-known one, which now I'm forgetting the name of, uh, that was specifically about uniting poor blacks and poor whites. And the organizer of that was actually assassinated. And the other a few others were arrested um, because to unite around class and economics is one of the most dangerous things to the the ruling elite, um, or is perceived as one of the most dangerous things to the ruling elite. So uh, I think it is it is really key. On the positive note, that was kind of like a downer note. On a positive note, there's a number of um, kind of new economy style projects about cooperatives, um, about economic justice, and connecting the lower income and higher income communities to do a kind of business-based or entrepreneurial-based exchange, uh, whether that's support for the creation of new businesses in low-income areas, or whether it's the um, buying of products from businesses ro run by previously low-income uh, cooperatives. And there's just a number of those. I'm thinking about a, a CSA bakery in Philadelphia that I read about. Mostly people of color running it, supported by mostly upper middle class white people in terms of 
buying CSA shares, but also doing some of the the circle of aunts and uncles of advisory council for the businesses and investment, uh, slow investors for the business. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, and that's just the context in which that relates to this, just to really lift that up is, you know, in a parallel circumstance, that's where we have um, all the class war rhetoric around lazy such and such, or this minority group doesn't want to work, or those riotous poor income, low income neighbor neighborhoods. Um, and so I see the the new economy projects that do get across class and because of the way race and class are connected in the US, often if you go across classes, you go across races too. Um, as a way of working on unraveling hatred, discrimination, uh, and the the fears that go along with it. So it's just, that's just one set of examples, and I'm sure there are many others. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So we're we're coming down into the last uh, 13 minutes of our time together today. And the burning question that Nina and I wanted to actually pose to you at the, the end of our kind of collective bringing our wisdom and experience together section of, of this um, is really, you've heard a lot of stories, you've heard a lot of examples, and we'd like to just do a go round with as many of you who feel comfortable speaking and chiming in on what might be some things that you might get involved in. And if you're already involved heavily, as some of us are, what might be one new idea that you might do? And it might be something that we haven't even mentioned today yet. Nina. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, welcome uh, Ali to the call as well. Uh, joined him in late. Um, because he's actually living in Pakistan and um, doing some really interesting work. So I would like him to uh, share a little bit, if you don't mind. Okay, apologies for being late, first of all. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just coming from uh, an inevitable wedding. And it's a wedding season, I think, uh, not just in Pakistan, but all around. And uh, I just made, I knew I was getting late and I asked my wife that I need to get there and she was like you always have something to do even on weekends at this point in time it's 12 o'clock here at 12 a.m but nevertheless apologies uh, for being late uh, sorry I couldn't catch up with a lot of discussion because as they just heard that it is just last 12-15 minutes of the webinar I'll definitely catch up and ask more about uh, the whole thing from Nina but nevertheless, uh, I'm Ali and I work for peace building and countering violent extremism in Pakistan. And I've been running uh, a small non-profit organization here with the name uh, Shaur Foundation. Shaur is an Urdu and Arabic word for awareness. And I run another venture with the name Peace Without Borders, um, which I plan to convert into a transnational campaign. Uh, bringing together uh, peace activists from around the world on one common platform and learn from their experiences and uh, share and replicate the good practices. So uh, if, if, as part of the discussion, if you have any specific question that I could answer and you could relate with uh, what has been discussed earlier, I would request Nina if you could ask uh, a straight question that I could perhaps answer and because I don't know what has been already discussed. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I thought maybe you can share a little bit about um, the, uh, how did you call it, the um, peace ambassador, something like this, that you build up in different cities. And we were talking about um, how present is the issue of hate and uh, xenophobia and discrimination in your area. So maybe something about like interfaith dialogue, uh, similar work. Yeah. Well, um, coming from a country, as I would say, uh, Pakistan since has been, uh, both I, I would say it has been a victim and at, at times it has been a perpetrator, not as a country, but 
people from Pakistan or maybe from this side of the world or region. Uh, this triangle, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, has been uh, pretty troubling for the last few decades. And uh, owing to this fact, without having indulged in any active state of war for the past uh, many years, Pakistan did not fight any war after uh, 1971. But in last 15, just in last 15 years, without being indulged in any war with any other country, we have lost more than 60,000 people, both civilians and military. And uh, most of them were killed in terrorist attacks, um, sectarian fights, um, religious bigotry, I would say. Uh, a lot of uh, negative activities and uh, violent activities were perpetrated by the majority, uh, the Sunni majority, uh, towards the uh, Shia minorities, towards the other minorities in Pakistan. So over the course of time, we have seen a rise uh, in extremism and violence uh, in Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, during the Afghan war, the state uh, sold the narrative of jihad and the narrative of violence that actually fought uh, the, the Soviets uh, in Afghanistan. And afterwards, uh, it did not change a lot. So what happened is like it has somehow become the narrative in, in uh, the generation that is now, uh, uh, you know, rising in Pakistan. So owing to and considering this uh, growing threat, uh, we decided to, you know, uh, run a campaign to make a campaign, an all-inclusive campaign that we could actually start from the universities, colleges and schools. Uh, that has different parts. One is, of course, it uh, begins and it's talk, it, it talks about the dialogue and the importance of dialogue uh, towards solving uh, this kind of issues. Because unless and until we admit there is something wrong, we cannot, of course, uh, propose the solutions. So uh, we have made uh, ambassadors from, uh, peace ambassadors from different schools, colleges in Pakistan. There are more than uh, 90 schools and universities and colleges on board with us. There are uh, uh, social leaders and peace activists from all across Pakistan who are on board. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to do an inclusive campaign that, uh, that has all members, like people from different walks of life, different religions, uh, different sects, different uh, political and ide uh, religious ideologies, and trying to make them understand that uh, unless and until we go inclusive, unless and until we go uh, compassionate about uh, things, we cannot solve this problem. Uh, the problem of extremism and the problem of hatred, especially in Pakistan. And then again, uh, I don't think so. Now we are living in the world where we can only talk about one country or perhaps just few uh, geographical dimensions. Everything that happens in one part of the world uh, affects the other uh, countries and people. So uh, cutting the long story short, uh, for the past two years now, uh, Peace Without Borders has been working with different organizations. We are trying to uh, you know, uh, encourage different youth organizations and different uh, CSOs, community service organizations, to include peace and non-violence as an effective, uh, as, and as an integral part of their uh, work, whatever they do. For instance, we used to work uh, for peace and our donor had this uh, clause that we should be environment friendly as well. So apparently peace and environment, there is a connection, but apparently there's, a, there's no direct connection. So if that would happen, we thought why not we should probably be, you know, uh, encouraging all the organizations who are working on health, education, uh, environment, and anything and everything else to make peace as a fundamental and a cross-cutting theme. Because unless and until uh, there is no peace, uh, I don't think so, you can work on anything else. So before you start working on anything and everything else, there must be a peaceful environment and a conducive and enabling environment. So that's what we've been doing. Um, and I, we, we are trying to you know, get in touch with friends like Nina and all other uh, peace activists from around the world so that we could share and learn from their experiences. And we could, you know, uh, encourage the peace activists to collaborate more for like this webinar is just another uh, example of that. So, you know, learning from the people so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and perhaps we could hear from the horse's mouth as they say. 
the people who are working in the field, the people who are experts, the people who are maybe uh, victims or people who could be potential perpetrators. But I think the dialogue is uh, the first and uh, the first and foremost step that we should be, you know, uh, taking up. And that's what we are doing, starting the dialogue, using different social political communication tools, uh, using theater, using, uh, you know, social media, using so, uh, like smartphone apps and conducting a little bit of things. Now, right now, I'm sitting in the room and I would like to show something. If you could, if you guys could see it, let me show. So this is the room I'm right now sitting in and we are trying to, you know, inculcate and encourage the culture of, you know, promoting the peace by and in, like running an inclusive campaign. It has, let me show you. Okay. If you guys could see, it has Bob Morley there, Peace Pilgrim and Bob John Lennon. And then it has different, uh, you could see Mandela here. You could see other people here. So, you know, we'll be having, and then there is an environment, like we're, we're trying to create something uh, where we could, you know, uh, and this culture that we could encourage and ask people to, you know, uh, maybe dedicate some places and uh, in their offices, in their homes, where there should be a discussion and dialogue about building peace in the society from an individual level to family level to societal level. So these are bits and pieces that we've been trying to, you know, uh, practice and encourage. So I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, so maybe we use the last few minutes for uh, other people if they wanted to answer the question that we Vera raised. Uh, what you would like to do? Uh, yeah. Come on, give me what I would like to do. Uh, no, so uh, thank you, Ali, for your input. I just um, well, I'm just very aware of the time, <laughs> and that is that we just have four more minutes, I think. So I wanted to maybe first briefly give the word to Rivera and then to the rest of the group. Yeah. Wrap up. I'm glad we made the time to hear from you, Ali. It, it's really important to get the international perspective. Most of us are from the U.S. on this call, and we do need to get out of our bubble more. It's good. We get lots of good ideas, like the things that you brought up. And thank you. Thank you very much. So let's do a quick go around and share what is maybe one thing that you've heard on the call that you could do in your own life to use as a nonviolent response to hatred, xenophobia, discrimination in a situation that you're facing. And we do need to keep our comments brief. But, uh, so we can hear from as many people as possible. Kathy. Oh, you're on mute. There you go. Okay, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll quickly stay, say that um, although I've been doing nonviolent um, personal practice for quite a while, it's taken the political situation here to activate me to the point where I want to get out and take action. So um, I'm on this call for that reason, and I'm also participating in the online Engage study group that's going on right now. And my hope is to be able to facilitate a study group of my own in this area. I also need to go um, do a little bit more homework about what's happening now. Um, I do belong to our food co-op, which may have been involved in what you were talking about earlier. Um, so they may facilitate that. Um, and then there's, I've also just learned in the last day or two, there's a, a newly created social justice group that's meeting at the Quaker Meeting House a couple blocks away. So I'm going to check them out. And it's possible that any or all of those may help me with or, or join in this, um, you know, a, an engaged study group and we'll continue that way. So the main thing is that there's, I know there's a lot of action going on in this area right now, at, well, around the whole, you know, the United States and the world due to current situation. Not, not all of it is nonviolent, so I would like to bring that flavor to as much of it as I can. Thank you, Kathy. Jane, let's hear from you. We have a citywide neighbors night out in August, so I'm gonna have one on my street, my block. I encourage everyone to come, my Muslim neighbors and everyone. That's one thing, and I'm gonna have a day for, encourage my housing group to have a day for dialogue with uh, renter activists in our area. 
And thirdly, I'm going to support my daughter who wants to create a new economy project for the homeless teens in her shelter. Wonderful. Thank you. Glad to hear that about the renter dialogue, renter land a homeowner dialogue so needed. And also, you know, we didn't talk a lot about homeless discrimination in the US. We should all know that it's a major problem that we're facing. Lots of stories about that, but no time. So next next call. Who else would like to share a story or a choice about something that you could do in your community? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Well, I know um, maybe it was Jane at the beginning. No, it wasn't. It was someone else, Kathy. Mm. Someone brought up social media at the beginning, and I do a lot of social media. And there's a, a lot of things that pass by my social media stream that I don't engage with. But one thing that I'm going to start doing is engaging more in that arena in uh, – asking people to question their positions and asking myself to question my position and opening those conversations. That's a small thing, but it, it becomes rather large when I look at the scope of what I do on a daily basis. And uh, Erica, I'm gonna unmute you in this section. Hopefully you have no huge background noise, but that way you can speak whenever you're ready. Okay, while you're thinking, because I would like to hear from a few more of you before we end the call, uh, I have shared a link to the Southern Poverty Law Center's Responding to Everyday Bigotry um, document. It's a really handy resource for many of the things that we've been speaking about in a like, list format. So I share that as a resource for you. At the end of today's call, uh, I will be uploading the recording of this webinar. And I will send an email to everyone, including the people who couldn't actually make it on the call today, but still wanted to watch the video later. And in it, I will put the links to all of the, the stories that I shared at the beginning uh, section of the webinar. So that you can have those links without me posting 20 of them in the chat box right now. All right, well, this is your chance. If you have one thing that you've heard on the call today that you think that you could apply in your own life or an idea that's come to you on the call today, this is your, your last chance ever in your whole life to speak it. Just kidding, this is your last chance for the call. <laughs> okay, well. The other thing that you, we can do right here at the end of our call is if you want to leave a little message to everyone about what you've appreciated or what you've enjoyed or that you've enjoyed or appreciated this call, go ahead and leave a, a chat box message. It's always heartening to see those. I am going to put the link to um, where you can make a donation to support this work if you would like into the chat box. And we do appreciate it. It helps us keep going with all of this stuff. There you go. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for showing up with your stories, your thoughts, your reflections, your honesty and sincerity, uh, because where these issues touch our lives is not comfortable places. And there's a beautiful thing about that, that as human beings, we actually are not comfortable with hatred, xenophobia, discrimination. We don't like it when it shows up in our faces. And it's our empathy neurons. We're actually wired. Uh, I'll talk all about that on another call. Anyway, we're actually hardwired as human beings to uh, dislike this stuff and to like inclusion, belonging, welcoming, kindness, compassion. So thank you all. Nina, thank you for helping to co-host and facilitate this conversation. And I hope you all have a very wonderful day and continue to be in touch. You all have our emails.
Thank you. Thank you. All the mics. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Thank you. very much. It's beautiful. See you all. Thanks for participating and uh, I hope to see you again. Thank you.